So I'm Myung Sik Kim. Uh, I'm from Imperial, uh, Imperial College London. And uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Marcus Aspermeyer, an old friend of mine, um, who is now the director of the famous Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information in Vienna. Yeah, so uh, I know that uh, uh, a few months ago uh, when Marcus gave another talk, there was a very good introduction about uh, he has, uh, he has uh, he, uh, him having done the first degree in philosophy, then moved to physics and the, uh, any connection between physics and philosophy in, except the fact that the both words start with P. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> F. Yeah, so I don't think I can add anything, so uh, I'll just move. And he has a very good uh, Wikipedia page, uh, so you can read uh, his background. But one thing is that even though Marcus these days is, uh, is fairly well known for his pioneering works on quantum optomechanical systems, uh, his quantum optics research, in fact, it did not start with this uh, uh, optomechanical system, but with uh, some the photonic system in Vienna. So he was one of the first. I mean, he 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 uh, he did the first demonstration of one-way quantum computing using photonic cluster state, which was amazing, and uh, that was a, a very good piece of work. Then. Uh, then he did uh, 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 many photonic QIP works before he moved to this uh, wonderful new uh, uh, the area of research and uh, the uh, bringing down the, uh, the emotional state of uh, mechanical system to a quantum regime. Uh, yeah, that's right. And his group was one of the first groups to demonstrate cooling of uh, micro mirror by radiation pressure. It's uh, yeah, the uh, amazing work. I remember that I visited this group while they were finalizing the manuscript to send to to, to Nature, and everybody was just concentrating on the uh, on the discussion. So I was there for two days. I think I don't have I didn't have much time to discuss on other things. So that's pity. But anyways, that work was a gr groundbreaking work. I, yeah, it was very good. Um, now uh, then, uh, he has many other demonstration of the non-classicalities of optomechanical system at nanoscale. You know, I'm supposed to talk, Myung Shik, right? Yeah, that is right. That is right. But I think this is more important than your talk, probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, that's not true. I'm very much looking forward to uh, his talk on how to control levitated system uh, for. Uh, uh, gravity quantum interference. Here we go. Um, thank you very much, Myung Shik. But um, I, I have to say, of course, I'm, I'm deeply honored, not only for the invitation, but also by this um, very humbling uh, um, introduction. But uh, you give me um, much more credit than I deserve. In particular, I just need to straighten the record here um, for the photonics experiments that I did back in Anton's group. Of course, here the credit goes to a large team um, of people with different involvements. Um, Philip Walter, in particular, for the for the cluster state, and um, and and many many other people. But this just to um, just for um, the historic correctness. <laughs> And I remember you being there at the time, um, but fortunately, Myung Shik, you came back um, many times afterwards, so we could make up for not having so much time during this particular <laughs> visit. <laughs> so, um, uh, you have been, and uh, in particular, uh, Anupam Sugato and Myung Shik, um, as the ones who invited me, have put me in a very um, uh, difficult position because you asked me. Um, to um, uh, sort of uh, contribute to your um, un ongoing efforts of uh, establishing quantum gravity in the lab uh, team and um, uh, combining the uh, recent efforts that we have in our uh, group with that. So I'm trying to um, 
make the stretch and um, trying to bridge these topics a little bit. Okay, uh, just a brief note, um, Anupama, I, uh, I see that there are several people in the waiting room. For some reason, I'm also getting these messages. Um, uh, I don't know if you can just let them in or someone can do that. Okay, so um, let, me, let me start by making a few general comments on the, um, this quite intriguing topic of, um, uh, of combining uh, gravity with um, quantum physics. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, it is a, a quite diverse uh, challenge, of course, as we all know. And basically, I'm just repeating now the known facts. Um, so first of all, then it is a mathematical challenge um, that has been um, well understood and uh, formulated already starting in the early 1950s um, from Gupta over well many other uh, famous people who um, tried to uh, tackle the mathematical challenges of formulating a, a quantum field theory in analogy to what um, has been known in these days of the electromagnetic field um, and uh, uh, partly failed for several reasons um, and uh, we know today of all the other different approaches, but the uh, outstanding que or the, the question at stake uh, at this particular challenge is how can we formulate a mathematically consistent framework for a quantum theory of gravity, uh, like following our, our other known ansätze of um, quantization and uh, without ending up in non-renomizable um, divergences and so on and so on. Um, on the other hand, the gravity quantum interface poses a conceptual challenge. Um, on the one hand, we have um, concepts like um, causal order, fixed space time, metric, um, and so on uh, from, the, from, the, from the general relativity point of view. But then we have uh, quantum superpositions, complementarity, indefinite causal orders, and so on on the quantum side of view. And the question is, how do you reconcile these, um, at least at first sight, seemingly um, incomp incompatible uh, conceptual bases with each other? And you also find a large bulk of literature, of course, on the topic, um, starting with, well, even before Bill Unruh, Unruh wrote a couple of uh, beautiful essays on that topic. Um, uh, what, it, what it means to actually have a coherent distribution of masses, the question how we could measure it, and so on and so on. And of course, um, um, moving up to uh, people like Carlo Rovelli, who will give the January colloquium, as I saw. And at the end of the day, of course, um, the actual question is, even if we solve the mathematical challenge, even if we get a better understanding for the conceptual challenge, does nature actually behave that way? The, the, the mere fact that mathematically you can uh, resolve the uh, challenge of um, writing down a quantum field theory of gravity does not yet mean that nature actually uh, requires such a description. So um, at the end of the day, it is predominantly also an experimental question. What evidence do we actually have so with evidence, I mean experimental evidence that gravity requires a quantum description. And so far, safe to say, we do not have any. So let me say a little bit about current experiments that exist at the interface between quantum physics and gravity. One of the most beautiful ones um, is the seminal experiment by Kolela Oberhauser and Werner, who showed for the first time the influence of um, uh, Earth's gravitational field on the wave packet of a quantum system, in that case a neutron. So um, let me see if you can see my cursor here. Um, to many people, this is a well-known um, experiment. So the main idea is uh, when uh, a quantum object, uh, a particle, uh, traverses through a classical field, uh, then it acquires a dynamical phase. 
um, that is uh, simply given by the uh, action that it uh, acquires while traversing through, the, uh, through this field. And of course, we cannot measure absolute phases, but we can measure phase differences. So what we do is we take the neutron, we split the wave packet uh, at a beam splitter, and then the neutron propagates along two different potential heights of Earth's gravitational field. You recombine that, and then you see interference fringes in the experiment as you rotate your um, a neutron interferometer and therefore change the actual um, uh, uh, the actual height difference in the gravitational potential between these two parts. And this was the first experiment to demonstrate the action of a classical gravitational field on a quantum wave packet. There have been um, many, many uh, future experiments, improvements of that, and in different um, colors, shapes, and then performances, of course. Uh, so for example, with ultra-cold newtons, um, there was um, uh, experiments that showed ba gravitationally bound states of neutrons in Earth's gravitational field. So where the idea is that you generate energy eigenstates of the neutron in the potential well formed by a surface and um, Earth's um, uh, gravitational uh, potential. And um, of course, there were the seminal experiments by, introduced by Kasevich and Chu with atomic fountains that also allowed to um, measure acceleration of atoms using uh, quantum systems. Now, um, the, um, uh, all of these experiments were still in the framework of Newtonian gravity. If you then uh, continue uh, more towards general relativity, uh, you have these famous experiments by Pound and Repka uh, back in the, in the 60s already that um, uh, experimentally demonstrated the gravitational redshift by emitting a photon at, from the top of Lyman Tower. This was actually from a mass power source and recollecting it at the top, at, at the bottom. And they actually had to compensate for the, um, for the redshift. Um, so for the uh, gravitational time dilation um, through a Doppler effect by moving, uh, so accelerating the receiver at, uh, down at the, um, at the Lyman Tower. Uh, a very famous experiment was also conducted in Dave Weinland's group, where by using uh, atomic clocks, they saw uh, a shift in the frequency of the atomic clock by lifting the optical table on which the, um, which the clock setup was built um, by 30 centimeters and observing the um, corresponding uh, change in the frequency due to the uh, different uh, gravitational potential. And um, right now, there, you will also find uh, there are several tests going on, um, have been happening, for example, on uh, testing the equivalence principle using quantum systems. And here are just a couple of um, examples. So where you also test now principles of general relativity now on the level of uh, quantum wave functions. In all of these examples that I named now, and I really left out many, many, so I apologize for those whose name I have not named. Um, on top of all of uh, um, um, those, at the end of the day, what I showed you um, is um, how a quantum system behaves in the presence of gravity. So all the quantum systems uh, here in these examples that I showed you behave as test masses in an external gravitational field. The question that I would like to ask is, um, what about quantum systems as source masses? Is it conceivable that we can have experiments in which a quantum system is so massive that it acts as a source for the gravitational field? And in a way, instead of asking the question, how does a quantum system react to gravity? Ask the question, how does gravity react to a quantum system? Okay. And this is, um, uh, sort of the context that I want to provide now for this um, occasion. This comes along with two questions that we need to answer. First of all, how small can we actually make a source mass and still um, measure an effect of its gravitational field? Yeah? Because what, what I really want to do is I want to build an experiment where I have um, uh, isolated quantum systems that interact gravitationally. But that also means that I really need to isolate gravity as a coupling force, which is a highly non-trivial um, undertaking, of course. 
um, because once you make your mass is small, gravity becomes small and all the other forces that are out there will become dominant. And I will show you an example in a second. Then the second question is, if we manage to make our uh, masses very small and couple them gravitationally, how can we make them quantum systems? Right? And so this is why the, the second question is, of course, how massive can a quantum system uh, actually be? Um, I, I will address both questions now in the order of appearance. So first of all, how small can a source mass be? And this, uh, this goes back to, uh, to another discussion in Vienna. It was not Mjungschik, but I remember we had Ulf Leonard as a guest back then. And uh, this was already 10 years ago. We were discussing these questions. And uh, at some point, um, Ulf said to me, but, but how, can you, how can you talk about those experiments if you cannot even measure the gravitational field of this chair? Right? Because uh, we were quantum optics people. Right? What would we know about measuring gravity? Nothing. And I, it sort of um, took me by my pride. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, he's actually right. So what we should do is, if we really want to be serious about such experiments, we should go out there and try to measure gravity of the smallest source mass possible. Right? And so this is, what we, this is what we set out to. So we asked the question, how can we measure gravity between as small source masses as possible? And since we already had some experience in, um, in, in micromechanical systems, we thought, well, you know, maybe we can have um, uh, two masses uh, uh, that are basically um, uh, sitting on uh, some micromechanical oscillators, and we can use that now um, to shake the mass, because the, the nice thing about a small mass is that you can just take it and shake it. And by shaking it, we produce a time varying gravitational field at the other mass. And this you can read out of again via a mechanical sensor. So this was the original idea. And we did some estimates. And then um, we, uh, we, we were sort of confident that um, if we were to, um, if we uh, were to um, uh, uh, build an experiment um, with our micromechanical oscillators, that um, if we compare the, um, uh, the achievable uh, fundamental thermal noise floor uh, with the signal, um, that we can get um, a reasonable signal to noise ratio still for masses on the millimeter scale. Yeah? And this would be a good first start because it would be um, by at least an order of magnitude smaller than what people have measured so far. Well, it turns out it's not so easy to build um, high quality micromechanical resonators with a huge mass on it. Right? This is a, actually a fabrication problem. And uh, recently a beautiful um, a proposal by Mika Zilampe's group came out where they also, they uh, basically take up our approach and they try to realize that by um, a membrane with a mass on top that they then couple the superconducting um, circuits and they achieved quite nice numbers. Our numbers back then, when we started this experiment, were not so nice. So we started to go to a more conventional approach of a Cavendish-type experiment. Um, so, of course, you know, at the end of the day, here you have a mass, and you are now sensitive to some acceleration that originates simply from a time-varying gravitational um, uh, source in, in at, a, at, a, at a different location. So uh, the challenge is now, can you build a sufficiently sensitive acceleration sensor? Okay. Now we started to build acceleration sensors in our lab and bumped into uh, interesting issues. Okay? So here's one example and I can give you many more. Um, so uh, what you see here is the time trace of our receiver. So basically of our um, inertial sensor, which is simply a mass sitting on a pendulum. Okay, it was a torsional pendulum and the mass was sitting there. And now we just monitor the deflection, which is a measure now for the acceleration that, um, the, uh, uh, that our test mass is um, now subject to. Okay? And um, as you can see, so this is time, this is amplitude, and all the red stuff is when people were aligning, right? And then you let go and you see um, uh, this is here, this is Friday, Friday evening. Well, this is still quite noisy because Friday evening people are out on the street, okay? So here's midnight, still some alignment, and then you see the signal is very nicely quiet. So this is like from 2 a.m. in the morning to 5 a.m. in the morning, or midnight to, to, 2 a, to 5 a.m. in the morning. You have a super quiet signal, then people start to get in and so on. Um, so we already knew we were sensitive to pedestrian noise outside 
Uh, and so we had to constrain ourselves to uh, measurements during um, the night or Sundays, we thought. Okay? And so uh, we did the whole thing, you know, we, we calibrated. This was all people in the lab and setting up. And um, then uh, Sunday night, huh? okay, so we just uh, set everything to zero and then let it go and everything was supposed to go well. Well, next day we enter and we analyze the signal and uh, we see, oh, everything is nice, okay? So it's quiet, quiet, quiet. And then suddenly all hell breaks loose. It's much more than anything we've ever seen at this time of the day. And um, it turned out that uh, these peaks that we saw they coincided, uh, this, this particular first large peak coincided with the winner, so with the entry of the winner of the Vienna City Marathon, who um, arrived at the, um, uh, who, who made it through the finishing line um, around one and a half kilometers away from our lab. Okay? So it tells you where the challenges lie. Mm -hmm. We also estimated, by the way, the noise that the gravitational field of the trams creates to our system. Um, and um, it's amazingly close to the signals that we uh, actually want to measure. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's um, how do you say, frighteningly, frighteningly close, okay? So, um, but after, uh, after some time and a lot of hard work of um, the people involved, which was uh, Jeremias Pfaff, Hans Heppach, and Tobias Westphal, Tobias joined our team from the gravitational wave community and uh, was really, um, the one um, coming up here with the um, experiment. And um, what you see now here, this is, uh, this is our current state of affairs. So we have this torsional pendulum. So this is a one millimeter gold mass um, attached to a glass rod with another uh, millimeter gold mass, um, a silica fiber slightly tapered, thanks to Arno Rauschenbeutel um, and his team for that and um, just a little mirror uh, to, to reflect the light to measure the deflection. And then um, at some distance away, uh, we have now the second, the source mass, which is also now a one millimeter sized gold mass. You see that here, that we just put on a stick and the stick we shake, okay? Uh, the whole thing, this is now the difference to original proposal. It's not at a hundred Hertz or so at large frequencies. The whole thing is at a few millihertz. Okay, so the, the, the shaking takes place at some, at some 12 millihertz, um, uh, which is why we are so sensitive to all these external noise sources. Well, so what you do now is, so you shake um, your mass and you well, m just monitor now the deflection of your, um, of, your, of your test mass pendulum. And uh, what you see here, is very nicely at so the blue one is the um, is the regular uh, displacement um, spectrum. Okay, so you see the resonance peak here at three millihertz, um, and uh, then you go down here very close to thermal noise. So um, we are uh, quite well isolated here, and you see when you start shaking the source mass, you see in the displacement um, these two peaks. So we modulate off resonance that we can actually um, uh, that we're not sensitive to, to all everything that go, going on here on resonance. And you see nicely that off resonance at the modulation frequency of 12 millihertz, no, 11 point something millihertz, um, we see a strong signal. And we even see a second order harmonic, um, a second order peak, which originates from the fact that we modulate in a one over R potential. Okay. Uh, it turns out that the magnitudes that we see here um, quite nicely agrees with what we expect from gravity. Uh, we, you, can, you can see uh, here our, uh, our recent paper where we do a more systematic study of all the noise sources and um, our gravitational coupling that we get is within the systematic uncertainties of our experiment um, within what is expected from the co-data value. So in a way, if we would use that as a G measurement, so as a measurement for the gravitational constant, um, then our measurement result would be in agreement with the published co-data value. Although our error bar is still quite large, it's on the order of uh, 10%. So it's not competitive yet, but it really shows you um, that we can now um, isolate gravity um, from a, a single source mass as small as a, a millimeter in size. Okay, so this is around 90 milligrams so far. Acceleration sensitivity is, sensitivity is quite nice down at these frequencies on the order of 10 to the minus 12 meter per second square. The non-gravitational forces are on the level of 10%. We also know where they come from. You see a Faraday shield here. So we do have still some charges that we can, uh, that we can shield. 
um, and um, we think that uh, that we can gain uh, still some orders of magnitude by improving here on the mechanical Q, which um, uh, right now was on the order of six. And we have already seen Qs of 20,000 in uh, other pendula. And that means we should be able to really go down another few orders of magnitude. Uh, as a side remark, um, it turns out that also for other reasons, measuring gravity of very small uh, source masses is um, interesting. Uh, there are so-called uh, speculative scalar field theories that have been uh, brought forward in the context of dark matter and dark energy. And um, they have an intrinsic shielding mechanism that is, um, that is, that is diminishing for smaller and smaller sources. So in principle, this is a way to provide new bounds to such uh, scalar field um, theories. And of course, it might also be a way to look at um, uh, gravity at small uh, distances. There are some beautiful early experiments by Andrew Garachi on that and um, uh, proposals. And um, of course, the famous Erdwash experiments at the University of Washington that have put those tests to perfection. And maybe miniaturizing that um, will help to get um, uh, to even smaller distances. There's uh, one last thing I would like to point out also just as a fun fact. Um, of course, this also provides another way of measuring G. I already said we have a 10% error right now, which is huge, but um, uh, the, uh, the precision of our experiment is already in um, an order of magnitude better than our accuracy. So in principle, if we get the systematics down, we should be able to start becoming also competitive for, um, for, 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 for gravity measurement, for, for um, Newton's constant measurement, maybe by having a little bit larger mass. Um, and just for those of you who don't know, this is important because um, there is still a quite uh, well accepted disagreement in the uh, value of um, Newton's constant. There's an accepted co-data value, but there is a uh, problem with um, all existing experiments in a way that um, more and more experiments have increased the precision Okay, so the error bar of an individual measurement has become smaller and smaller, but have not increased the accuracy. So meaning that the spread of the, um, of the center of mass here, of the, in, of, of the individual um, uh, measurements, um, has remained uh, more or less constant, uh, which means that the discrepancy between those measurements actually grew. And um, so what you... Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not fully understood yet uh, where these deviations come from. And this is why uh, people have suggested that other measurement methods might help to shed some light and maybe we can contribute um, there. So the people are desperate. You can see there are some plots that you can find in the literature um, where people are plotting the, the value of Newton's constant as a function of source mass. Okay, and they actually fit it with a non-zero slope. So, <laughs> Uh, I mean, this, this was an attempt to find some systematics uh, in the experimental setup, but I, I just find the plot very funny. And we now added a data point somewhere um, out there uh, at, uh, at 90 milligrams, um, but unfortunately with a very large error bar. So we don't know if we can add something to the slope or not, which would be funny. <laughs> okay, anyways. Now, uh, coming to my, to my second point, how massive can a quantum system be? Okay. Um, so, we, I think we understand now a little bit that um, isolating gravity of smaller and smaller masses is challenging, but um, I'm also confident that uh, we will learn a lot while we go down um, further in mass. So how can we push up um, quantum systems? Well, here the road to go, and Myungchik has mentioned that uh, very briefly already in his introduction, uh, is what I believe um, uh, what we have learned during the last uh, decade in the context of trying to uh, control mechanical systems in the quantum regime. Uh, so the, the early ideas of that go back to Braginsky to the, to the 1960s, but only through the advent of combining nanophotonics with nanomechanics uh, have people really managed to uh, create systems, optomechanical systems, so where the interaction between light and mechanics in the presence of optical cavities resulted then in the possibility to achieve control over the mechanical motion of nano and micromechanical systems in the quantum regime. 
I left out now in that description LIGO. LIGO is an exception where the performance is so large in terms of um, power and the cavities and mirrors that they also, um, through another way, in a macroscopic regime, starts to enter um, the, the quantum regime. So uh, if you look at the literature, what has happened over the last 10 years essentially is um, that we have really evolved as a field. So with many contributions around the world from many people from quantum ground states, uh, cooling off nanomechanical systems um, in different realizations in microwave circuits and all photonic, um, um, optical phot and photonic circuits um, over the generation of quantum squeeze states of motion. Uh, again, with um, uh, in that case now with um, um, microwave systems and uh, by borrowing ideas from the trapped ion community that have introduced um, this concept of using reservoir engineering for generating squeeze state. So basically cooling your system into a squeeze ground state, which had not been realized uh, before, even for trapped ions. And so in that case, it was um, mechanical systems that pioneered also trapped ion uh, research in a sense. But now um, uh, Jonathan Holm um, in Zurich has had many beautiful results that um, showed that um, with much higher performance than for the massive systems um, for the ions. Um, and then, uh, then after this, even going to non-Gaussian quantum states of motion um, uh, to reaching really, so basically Fox states, for example, um, single phonon states of mechanical systems until reaching quantum entanglement. So it's safe to say uh, we have now basically a toolbox to really um, m control, m um, prepare and read out quantum states of motion of all kind in involving massive mechanical systems. So that's already a start. Yeah? So massive meaning still just to set the, just set the record straight here. Um, of course, now we're talking here about like 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 atoms. Okay, so that means like what's 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 13 kilogram or so, 10 to the minus 12, um, compared to um, our um, uh, what, let's say 100 um, milligrams, so still like the 10 to the minus 5. Okay, so uh, we still need to bridge here uh, on the order of 10 orders of magnitude. But it's, um, I think this is. The gap is actually closing quite fast. Now, the problem is what I have not yet told you and basically um, um, swept under the, under, the, under the carpet is that although we do have beautiful quantum control of this, me of this mechanical system, so uh, going up to 10 to the 16 um, atoms even, the coherence times are quite small and also the displacements that you achieve are quite small. So in this um, seminal paper by, um, by, 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 um, no, by Andrew Cleland, uh, they demonstrated for the first time superpositions uh, between um, a zero and one Fox state of mechanical motion. And what you see here is the Ramsey interference pattern. So it's a clear signature. You can see it in an experiment, but physically, if you look at the, displacement in real space between the two states that are in a superposition, you find out that um, the, the difference in atom position is just on the order of a nucleus, okay? Like on the order of some femtometers. So even while it is a clear effect that you can measure, in the context of um, any gravitational coupling, where it's interesting uh, to then look at uh, macroscopically distinct states in a superposition, uh, a femtometer displacement is just not large enough, okay? Uh, on the other hand, of course, we know from metawave interferometry, from free fall experiments um, that have less atoms, but huge coherence times, seconds, and also um, superpositions of large distinction, okay? So um, when Markus Arndt in Vienna throws his macromolecules through his um, slits and gratings, then they, uh, they, they are pre being prepared in superpositions um, where the, the center of mass is separated much, much more than the size of the actual object. So these, these are genuinely macroscopic um, superpositions, superposition of macroscopically distinct uh, states of the particle. Now, what you would like to do in order to enter this regime that we find interesting 
um, you actually have to uh, combine those two domains. So you want to combine um, the, 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 um, the fact that you have many atoms in a small volume of space, so a large uh, density, um, with large coherence times and the ability to manipulate it um, outside of an harmonic confinement of a clamped oscillator. And well, the idea is uh, take the best of two worlds, take the solid um, from the solid state <laughs> the mechanical oscillators and take the free fall um, by basically just cutting here the support, then it falls, but you levitate it now with some external potential. Okay? So this is why um, levitated mechanical systems are a promising way to go in this direction. Super brief introduction to levitation. Uh, the whole idea is, of course, if you have a dielectric particle that interacts with a laser field, uh, what it sees is um, uh, essentially if an induced dipole moment um, uh, and, and um, the, um, the electric field here that's, that your induced dipole um, sees is just the polarizability. Um, uh, the, the, the dipole is just the polarizability times the E field. So um, what the particle actually sees is the intensity of the beam. And um, this means that the potential that the particle sees is just the inverse of the intensity. So if I now have a Gauss beam here, a Gaussian beam profile um, along, let's say, this direction here, then the potential that my particle sees is simply just an inverted Gaussian. And that means for very small displacements, I can approximate that as harmonic potential. And the same is true, of course, for all the other three directions, which is why I get a 3D harmonic confinement of my particle in the focus of a laser beam. Another way to see it is, of course, also to say, well, if I have this, um, if I have this total energy, then the force that my particle experiences is just the gradient. And this is then the gradient of the intensity. This is why it's called a gradient force. So what you get now um, is if the particle moves to the outside, you get a, um, you get a, a attractive force towards the um, intensity maximum, okay? Um, so this is what I just said. If you have a beam profile, a Gaussian beam profile, um, then the potential is just the inverse of the intensity. These are typical particles. So in our case, what we're using are particles on the order of 100 nanometer in size, 150 nanometers, like 70 something nanometer radius. So um, what we do is uh, we now uh, take the particle, um, uh, basically, well, you can see it here. I uh, have a microscope objective. Um, you focus the light very strongly. You trap your particle in front of that. And ideally, you do that inside a vacuum chamber. This is this one. If you evacuate, the um, typical experience that you make is that the particle just vanishes for reasons that are still to be discussed in full detail. So what you do is you basically measure the X, Y, Z position of the particle and um, use this um, to generate a parametric feedback directly on the spring constant. So basically modulating the intensity of your laser beam uh, to provide a feedback mechanism to stabilize the particle. And by that, you can actually um, keep it and then um, go down and down in pressure until you have an isolated, levitated dielectric particle at 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. Um, millibar. And these are experiments that were um, pioneered by Lukas Novotny and Roman Kidan, um, who introduced this feedback cooling to stabilize these particles down um, uh, at such low pressures and then observe all kinds of effects like um, back action um, of the laser light and so on and so on. So what you can do now is you can add now additional feedback cooling. We have recently um, worked together with a team from the TU Vienna that uh, helped us to implement directly a Kalman filter and optimal um, control that now allows us to using this readout. So we have now a near Heisenberg limited readout at our, um, for our particle. We combined it now with state estimation through Kalman filter and um, uh, direct optimal feedback control to um, achieve um, occupations uh, below a phonon. So we can cool now by direct feedback into the quantum ground state of motion. Another way to do that um, is by using an optical cavity. So if you don't want to go through the hassle of reading out and doing all this, um, all this feedback protocol, you can also do it passively. And um, there's, uh, these are beautiful ideas that have been put forward by the atomic physics community many years ago, where they were asking originally the question, okay, now we can cool atoms, how can we cool molecules? What do we do if you have a particle where we don't have any directly accessible internal transitions? 
um, is there another way to do it? And um, the idea was then, of course, dispersive coupling, and this translates one to one, uh, of course, to a polarizable particle. Because the only thing you rely on is now the fact that you do have um, a, a, polar, a, a, a finite polarizability um, that the, your, your particle can then is using to couple to the magnetic field. And I give you um, the idea in a, in a nutshell. The idea is you have a particle in a tweezer, and um, uh, what you what you do now is you just put a cavity around it. Okay, so just like that. You don't do anything else. If the part in the tweezer put the cavity around it, you do not even drive the cavity. You don't have to do that. But you do it for the experimenters, of course, you drive it slightly to stabilize. You sometimes have to stabilize the cavity, but at the end of the day, uh, you place the particle inside, just inside the cavity. And what happens now is that um, the, 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 the scattering of the particle just from the dipole trap itself is resonantly enhanced through the cavity. Okay, um, and uh, that means, uh, so, and this is, this is called, uh, this is so-called coherent scattering. What you can do now is you can place the particle at the location of an uh, intensity minimum of the cavity field, which means that um, uh, the, 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 the emission um, of light is actually forbidden, right? So imagine this particle that scatters light is essentially just an emitter. So if you put an emitter into the intensity minimum of a cavity, then um, the photons emitted um, destructively interfere. Okay? So what happens is it's, it's dark, it doesn't, it doesn't emit. Um, however, due to the motion of the particle, um, you break the symmetry of this problem. So um, you now have the case that uh, you have now Stokes and anti-Stokes scattered photons. And um, if, you now, um, if you now align your cavity in such a way that, for example, an anti-Stokes scattering process that takes away energy from the particle is resonantly enhanced here by the particle, then you can cool it uh, and cool it and cool it. And um, if your Stokes and anti-Stokes sidebands um, have a distance that is larger than the cavity line width, which is the sideband resolved regime, then the um, anti-Stokes scattering process can dominate and you can cool to the quantum ground state. And this is the so-called coherent scattering. It has interesting features uh, for those of you who, um, who know how to work with cavities. So first of all, it, re it only requires an empty cavity, um, which means that you're not limited by other effects, like when you drive the cavity with an additional laser, you always affect the potential here inside, right? So you get cold trapping effects, and also you add phase noise to the particle motion. So the particle will actually heat up due to the phase noise of the laser, and you don't have that in this case. The skin is insensitive. Um, uh, to phase noise, or let's, in other words, the phase noise here of the trap laser is also strongly suppressed by the presence of the cavity. And as I just said, um, very funny, you, you do have maximum coupling um, for cooling in this direction when you are at the intensity minimum. In principle, you can also achieve 3D coupling. So um, these are works here, so one from us and from the Novotny group who demonstrated this principle just some time ago. And then uh, you can take it to the extreme. And uh, here's an example now. Uh, I, I, I already said everything. You have the particle inside the cavity. The cavity is detuned, uh, the cavity frequency is detuned with respect to the drive laser. Okay, so you see here's the drive laser in frequency space. And uh, now you see that the anti-Stokes scattered photons, so those that retrieve uh, uh, energy from the particle or carry away energy from the particle, they are resonantly enhanced. The Stokes scattered photons, where um, energy is deposited on the particle by the tweezer light um, in the inelastic scattering process are suppressed, such that at the end of the day, you cool, 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 until um, you actually hit the quantum ground state. So here are sideband measurements where you can actually see that um, you go down. And at the end of the day, if you do um, analysis of this, you can see that you achieve occupations also down below one. So what we have here now in both cases um, is we have now um, a room temperature object. Okay, so a silica um, uh, 150 nanometer uh, dielectric object kept at room temperature for which the center of mass motion is cooled down to uh, the, the, the regime of some 10 micro Kelvin, meaning into the quantum ground state of motion. And the whole thing only at pressures here for, of the order of 10 to minus six, or in the other case that I showed you, 10 to the minus eight. Um, there are some limitations. I don't go into the details. If you're interested, just ask. Okay.
so I, I come to the end now more or less. Um, let's now, let's, let's look at the consequences of this, okay? So how can we go in a regime um, where, I mean, this is something I, I would find super interesting. Um, can we have a large wave packet? Okay, so now we have prepared the motional quantum ground state. But what does it mean? Well, it means that um, the position uncertainty, or let's say the wave packet size that describes our particle motion, is now on the order of three picometer. Well, it's not so surprising. Uh, I mean, this is a, a solid state object which is well localized. Okay, but still, the motion is now determined by quantum physics, okay, but only on the level of three picometer. But can we, could we, in principle, generate a situation where the wave packet extends now the size of the particle itself? Can we uh, create, a, um, can we create a, a wave packet of the size of the particle? Okay, so one possibility, free fall. You, this is the nice thing now about levitated objects. We prepare the ground state and we can now just switch off the trap. So um, this thing could just then now um, evolve in free fall and after, a few, um, after some 10 milliseconds would already reach, if it just would be free dispersion of the wave packet, the size um, of the particle radius. Okay, that would be uh, quite fascinating. Um, so let's just briefly look at the limitations. Um, uh, limitations are, of course, the coherence. Okay, and I basically just throw a couple of references at you that you can have a look at. At the end of the day, you need to calculate, you need to compute the decoherence. Um, obviously, you um, will have uh, some additional environment, the particle couples too, you have gas scattering, you have black body radiation, and all of that can be taken into account quantitatively. And if we do that, we get the following number. So in our case, again, here we have a particle at 10 to minus 6 millibar at 300 Kelvin. We have a certain gas scattering rate and a certain recoil rate of the, um, of the photon shot noise of the, of the dipole trap. Um, so the photon recoil and the gas scattering, those two together, they limit the coherence time inside the trap. So when a trap is still switched on to something on the order of eight microseconds, or like 15 coherent oscillation. In free fall, okay, so if you now switch off the trap, the recoil rate is gone and the wave packet now expands and the free fall coherence time is now limited to like two microseconds in this regime. It sounds funny at first sight that this is smaller than this one, but the point is, um, as the wave packet expands, it becomes more susceptible um, to collisions with gas, okay? And so this is why, um, this is why uh, the coherence time now decreases even. So we could, with our settings here, expand the wave factor by a factor of three or so before we decohere the, the, the position and momentum correlations in the wave packet. So um, if we really would like to have a wave packet size larger than a particle size, then for this type of experimental configuration, we should think of really having ultra low vacuum and also environment temperature that is smaller than um, like 130 Kelvin, okay? Because black body really becomes an issue for particles um, of that size. And this is black body of the environment, right? really just black body absorption, black body uh, photon absorption of the particle. So this is the this is the challenge um, for the um, for the future. So um, now I I don't have I don't have any more time. So I think I just um, I will um, I will skip some of uh, some of the things that I wanted to say. Um, obviously, you have heard, or many of you have heard already about uh, this idea of the ultimate experiment um, to generate entanglement via gravitation, which goes back to uh, Feynman. Uh, at the famous Chapel Hill conference in 57, where he suggested to look at, a, at an object that um, by some Stein Gerlach uh, device uh, is being put in a superposition of two positions and this then being coupled to another object. Right? And of course, well, for us as quantum physicists, we know that this should create, um, this should create an entangled state, but um, this entanglement generation where gravity uh, is from a GR perspective not so obvious. So from a quantum perspective, it's totally obvious. Right? You, have to, you have to generate entanglement. From a GR perspective, if you really um, start with the, uh, with, with the field equations, okay? So not just Newtonian gravity, but with the field equations where the masses source the space-time metric, then the only way um, how a um, free evolution in a um, in a non uh, in in a in a fixed space it, it, uh, the free evolution of a particle in a space time metric can generate entanglement is if the space time metric itself is in a superposition 
if the space-time metric is, fi is fixed, then any geodesic motion um, of two particles that are uh, initially separable will remain separable. Okay? I mean, uh, this is something that also uh, Rovelli and others pointed out, but it shows you where the problems are. The problem, the problem actually arises from the GR perspective when once you introduce um, the, um, uh, really the notion that you have to have a field um, that acts uh, in, your, um, in your system. Okay, very good. So now I'm going to skip uh, several things. Um, of course, we can now, um, maybe, I just, maybe I just mention very briefly, um, of course, you can calculate now um, uh, how to entangle the time scales. The most easy thing is to basically say, oh, I just take two, coupled uh, two harmonic oscillators and I couple them via gravity. Then you can write down immediately how long does it take to do that. But you, you, you will see a very interesting scaling. You see that the entanglement time actually scales um, with the separate uh, with the with the magnitude of the um, uh, of the wave packet size. Okay, so this is a universal feature um, that in order to generate in order to generate fast entanglement, you need large wave packets or um, large superposition sizes. One of the two. It's actually the same. It turns out. So uh, if you if you write down the um, quantitatively. Um, the two problems are exactly the same um, on the time scale wise. And in one case, for the harmonic oscillator case, it's actually the wave packet sizes. So you need large wave packet sizes to have uh, fast entanglement. And um, for other examples, and they're beautiful examples that have recently been suggested by um, Sugato, Myungchik, and others, and also by um, uh, 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 Maletto and Vatko uh, Vedral, um, you in that case, you have actually, uh, you require large superposition. So the fluctuations of the wave packet of the coupled oscillators are now substituted by the large superposition sizes. So this is the actual challenge, okay? And um, it turns out, coming back to the case of the coupled oscillators, um, and my example that I gave you before of just free evolution. So how do you create now large wave packet sizes? And I think this is, this is the actual challenge. And it turns out, um, if you just do free evolution, that's not the best thing you can do. Remember, at the end of the day, you want to do it in an optimal way, meaning the fastest way. And um, the group of uh, Riol Romero Isart at Innsbruck pro provided uh, already back in 2016 a beautiful idea um, that if you, um, uh, if you now look at the evolution of a wave packet on a dynamic landscape, instead of just free evolution, you can speed things up dramatically. Okay? So the idea would be instead of um, just waiting for your uh, particle to a uh, wave packet to expand in free space. Um, you let it expand on top of an inverted potential, for example. Then you get exponential growth in the size and so on and so on. So this is beautifully laid down in this paper. And this is also um, why we are now looking at possibilities to manipulate the wave packet of the particle in unharmonic potentials. Okay? And one thing that you can do, this is work by Mario Campini and Nikolai Kiesel's team here in Vienna, Remember, um, I told you the um, potential landscape that the particle sees is just the inverted intensity uh, profile that the particle is subjected to. Okay, so if you have a Gauss beam here, the inverted is just a, is just a, is just an inverted Gaussian harmonic potential. But if we now manage to uh, provide the particle with intensity profiles that look like that, which you can generate just by superposing, for example, TM00 with the next higher order Hamid Gaussian mode. Um, uh, then you see you can, um, uh, you can actually create uh, different types of potentials from a quartic potential uh, to a double well potential to even a repulsive potential. And um, these are things, this is work in progress. So this is um, Mario Campini's experiment where by overlaying um, two beams on an SLM, we can actually in real time change the potential landscape in the presence of the particle. And we can do that on time scales. Uh, really uh, on a few nanoseconds, uh, some tens of nanoseconds, which are much, much larger than the natural um, uh, oscillation frequencies of the um, potentials that we have. Here. And this is related to other work also by the group of Lukas Novotny, where they use two tweezers, for example, to, uh, to generate non-harmonic um, potential landscapes. Okay, so I think I'm going to end here um, uh, with, two con with, with a concluding remark. I do that very fast. Um, so I conclude with uh, a comment of what we are doing and what we are not doing, okay? 
And this is, um, this is inspired by some recent encounters, or let's say encounters, these are not recent anymore over the last years or so when talking to people. So some statements that one finds uh, in one variant or the other um, from people, the generation of entanglement shows the quantization of gravity. The generation of entanglement can be described by a purely classical gravitational field. Okay, so uh, both of them are uh, definite no. Okay, um, so question is now what um, what can we say? Okay, and so here is my take on that. So uh, there are here are four statements: the generation of gravitation induced entanglement number one can be described in a Hamiltonian picture using a classical Newtonian potential um, and quantizing only the um, uh, quantizing only um, the canonical degrees of freedom. Um, number two, uh, gravity, the generation of entanglement cannot be explained by assuming a fixed metric, but by a superposition of metrics. So if you talk in the language of metrics, in that sense, it cannot be explained by a purely classical notion of gravity. Um, also, the generation of entanglement falsifies semi-classical theories. And uh, in my opinion, this is the most important contribution and the most undisputed one. And, um, uh, and had, uh, the gravitational induced entanglement has nothing to do with what is usually understood as quantizing the gravitational field. And what is usually understood with quantizing, meaning quantizing the field's degrees of freedom. Okay? Um, if, of course, you take a Feynman approach, and here's a nice uh, quote that Feynman actually made. So he said back in, in the Chapel Hill conference, if I have an amplitude for a field, that's what I would define as a quantized field. If you take that approach, then um, you are allowed to make that statement. But it has to be qualified like that. And actually, if you also look in the papers by, um, by Sugato and, and, and Vladko, um, they uh, very nicely qualify it in that way. OK, so I think I'm done. Um, uh, here, this I just mentioned without explaining it to you because we're out of time. If you want. Um, uh, ask me. So what I just want to say, uh, there's some recent work uh, that we did. Um, as a, this is a side dilemma actually to what I just said, that um, uh, if you are able to generate um, entanglement via um, gravity, then by another argument, you still imply, it, it implies also some um, uh, necessity of quantizing the field degrees of freedom also. Otherwise, you run into inconsistencies with um, complementarity or causality, which in a way is a trivial statement because of course you would like to have that from um, all quantum theories in even in a linearized regime. Okay, I'm done. Um, let me see where's my conclusion slide. This is more or less my conclusion slide. I think it's so super fascinating to see that we are piling up now momentum starting from the early experiments in the 60s where we have photons, coupling to gravitational fields, then later in the 70s, neutrons coupling to gravitational fields. The whole thing then um, in the 80s came a completely new um, experimental setting with atom interferometers and ultra cold neutrons, ultra stable optical clocks that really allowed them precision measurements of Newtonian gravity and GR effects up to today where we now have extreme meta waves uh, we have lattice clocks, uh, incredible performance. We can start now putting experimental constraints to dark energy, dark matter. We have analog quantum gravity. I mean, it's really, uh, the list is so long. that, um, And we can also provide low energy constraints for quantum gravity theories and then uh, enter a regime where we um, uh, can test the consequences um, of um, what how gravity reacts to a quantum systems still far in the future but i think um, that the methods that we have here um, are a viable way at least it's worth pursuing okay if we fail um, then it's going to be for practical reasons and not for fundamental reasons and if we fail for fundamental reasons it's also interesting okay so no no, no matter what we will learn something either from the practical or from the from the fundamental point of view okay so basically i already said you everything um, on this slide. I don't need to repeat that. That is actually what we're doing in my group now. And um, let me just briefly introduce you to the, to the people. So we have different teams um, working on optical levitation, uh, either in combination with cavities or with potential landscape shaping. And this all is done in strong collaboration with the team of Nikolai Kiesel and with other collaborators. Um, what I have shown you now, the results have been uh, strongly driven by uh, Uro Stelic, in particular, Kane Der Manuel Reisenbauer, 
um, and uh, Lorenzo Marini and Constanze Bach. The gravity experiment team is headed by Tobias Westphal. We um, have ongoing discussions with Eric Edelberger to understand better the relevance of our um, experiments and potential for the future. And also big thanks to Bob Wall, Jaslav Bruckner, and um, Alessio Berlenke here for all the other discussions on the theoretical in conclusions. Okay, so thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Marcus, for a wonderful talk. I'm sure that uh, there must be questions. So, yeah, Marcus, so I will ask some questions, but so I, I mean, <clears throat> I don't want to go into that, but I just want to make a comment on the, you know, the, uh, so, uh, they, we, we still believe that it will be a you know uncontroversial signature of you know quantum nature of gravity if you do do entangle so uh, because I mean as long as you are accepting a mediator see this is the uh, as long as there is a mediator which is very standard uh, yes yes exactly I, well, that is what I said no I mean um, you need an additional assumption so you need to assume that you do have a field okay. So this is something you cannot, um, if, you, if you don't have a field, then you just have two couple oscillators that... Yeah, um, if you have action at a distance, yeah, direct, yeah, then, then yeah. yeah. But I'm afraid this is not an assumption. So this is, a, this is a wrong remark. This is not an additional assumption. You see that quantum field theory works extremely well. There's no doubt that quantum field theory should not work at a very miniature scale. LSC, it works so well. We have not seen any violation of quantum field theory, which works in the... And, and counting exactly the degrees of freedom, which uh, exactly you highlighted, off-shell and on-shell degrees of freedom. So I think it is not fair to say that we are making an extra assumption. We are just working within the minimal assumption where quantum field theory and quantum mechanics should work. So, so for an experiment, uh, it is an additional assumption because we perform the experiment, at least in its present form, in a regime where no feature of a propagating field is required. So this is a this is a subtle um, this is a subtle thing of course because for an experimenter you always want to oper so you want to perform an experiment and you want to make so you want to make claims based on the, uh, the experiment that you have right I mean um, and so uh, the problem is of course um, at this stage there is no loophole free experiment in a sense and so this would be a possible loophole that nature could trick you by not behaving um, so basically by saying oh. In this type of experiments, I simply don't behave as a field. And I cannot, I cannot exclude that in my experiment. I so agree. I, not I, exclude. Then I, you can ask the question that uh, why LSE didn't work. I mean, you, you could have asked the same question to LSE people or the Higgs people or those who have discovered the Stan model Higgs, for instance. Yeah, I, I think a dynamic, a dynamic version would be interesting. That is true. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by dynamic version? You know, with, with time, you do. So you, you really see the time time difference of the flight. Now you can also ask the same question. You see what you uh, even in the standard Higgs the discovery, you don't see the Higgs. What you see is the four leptons or two photons uh, as a witness, and here you see the witness as your entanglement. And of course, the offshell nature of the Higgs and offshell nature of the graviton, they're exactly the in the same way, except the gravity has different degrees of freedom as compared to the standard Higgs. You see, coming from quantum optics, um, we, 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 we are very careful people. Um, so it took, it took us 70 years to um, perform an experiment that um, unambiguously uh, um, uh, proved the, um, or confirmed the uh, quantum light, uh, light quantum hypothesis. Right? So, um, and it took us, um, what, 60 years, uh, 50 years to perform a loophole-free Bell experiment. So you see, uh, quantum optics people always take a long time until they're really satisfied that they yeah, that's perfectly uh, rigorous, right. especially rigorous experiments. Yeah. I think we should give, uh, so there are many raised hands. So, so Marcus, so yeah. technical questions, I'll ask a bit later, but let's ask, let's give the others opportunities. So there are many people I see. So both Jonathan and Andy have raised hands. So. So okay. we ask uh, Jonathan first. Um, yeah, thanks, um, Marcus. I, I I was interested in the big G controversy. Um, are you able to say more, a little bit more about the the system, the, the the checks people do? Does it, if I run the same experiment, 
say at different times over a long period of time, does it change? Or if I run the same experiment in different locations, does it change? Is any of that known? Yes, um, uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. And this is a big discussion. So um, a couple of years ago, I attended a, um, a conference on uh, exactly that topic where, um, uh, where people uh, agreed to swap experiments. So um, what's right now happening is that um, an experiment from, I think, Birmingham, I don't recall now exactly the location, so one of the, one of the, uh, um, one of the um, semi, one of the milestone experiments is being rebuilt now. And I think they really dismantle it at one location and build it up in another location. Okay, so they're swapping experiments to make sure um, that, um, and also another team is then going to conduct the experiment. Okay, so, um, yeah, so the, all these things are being tested as we speak. And then uh, you see one of the big things, I, um, I should put up the slide here now. Um, one of the big things um, you see, this is an error budget, okay? And you see that um, uh, one of the largest um, contributions to the error budget comes from the masses itself, because these are macroscopic masses and they are not fully homogeneous. Uh, so that means um, you, the, 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 the center of mass can actually uh, vary, okay? So mm -hmm. your, your, your imprecision in the knowledge of the center of mass is a huge systematic uncertainty. Then you have temperature fluctuations where then through density inhomogeneities, uh, in, in, in the center of mass starts to drift over long timescales because these things are also um, experiments on super long timescales. So that's why I'm so eager to also go to shorter timescales. There are so many... I mean, this is bulky experiments, okay? I mean, it's, it's even amazing that they get to such great um, uh, both precision and um, I, I would say given the, given the, 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 the type of experiments, the accuracy is remarkable. <laughs> and, and if they do them a year later, so you mentioned swapping location, but if they do them a year later or like what's the time scale that these experiments are conducted? Uh, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. This I cannot answer, unfortunately. Okay, but I, I could imagine because these experiments have been going on for also for decades that these type of tests have been made and that they um, would enter the, um, yeah, that so as far as I remember from discussions, I think those are quite reproducible. Uh, you see here, for example, here you can see it, no? You see the, the BIPM, so that's the Birmingham 2011 result and the Birmingham 2013 result, okay? So you see, um, they they reduced the they reduced the um, the, the um, they increased the precision, and um, they didn't change too much in the in the values. So this this seems quite consistent. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Andy, Andy has no questions. Hey, Marcus, what a really nice talk uh, today. Hey, very impressive results, as always. I had a question about the cavity cooling. Uh, yes. So just the prospects for getting three-dimensional cooling uh, where every direction is deep in the ground state. Do you think that's going to need more than one cavity, or do you think you can do that in a single cavity? It depends on what you define with deep, how you define deep. So I, I think we need, you will need a combination. And um, the reason for that is, and I'm, I'm pretty sure um, you, you must know, but I say it nevertheless, um, that, uh, of course, the, um, for the, for the um, X direction, so for the cavity, that for the, for the, along the cavity axis and orthogonal to the cavity axis into the plane of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the drawing board here, um, the ideal position um, for the particle is in the intensity minimum. However, for the Z direction, the ideal position is in the intensity maximum. And this is, a, so now you have a conflict, okay? So what you can do now is you can, uh, you can make a compromise. You go somewhere in the middle, uh, a bit again on the slope, but then of course you start to couple in more noise. Um, so um, when you look at here, the, uh, here, when you look at the limitations, you see deep ground state should be possible in the sense no, that um, uh, uh, you saw so your sideband resolution is uh, below 10 to minus 1, uh, phase noise is below 10 to the minus 3, uh, this is just pressure limited. Um, so if you want to go on to the level of let's say 10 to minus 1, um, I think you will, you, will, you will hit then here the, um, you will hit here the, the phase noise limit again. So I assume short answer, 
I think you will have to combine what I just showed you, um, uh, namely some, some, some feedback control in the set direction and then x, y with the cavity. I see. OK, thank you. And the hope is, of course, that you can live with one direction being not so much in a ground state, but I, I, yeah. I yeah. The other thought would be to, def, you know, drop or have the tweezer come in at an angle to, you know, cavities that are orthogonally positioned, right? And yeah, then that's you, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which may be too complicated. <laughs> yeah, I remember Marcus Ant had a setup with cross cavities. Or maybe, I think you even too, no? I, I, uh, so well, we've thought about it. We haven't actually done that, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or at ETH, you know, I mean, people, so people have done cross cavities, huh? so, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, th there's also a question by Bas, right? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. I just had a question about the uh, fundamental limits or the limits to the coherence time of these uh, levitated particles. So you mentioned black body uh, absorption. So at what point should you start worrying about black body emission of the particle? And is that, is that a, a limitation as well? Yeah, thanks, Bas. Um, so I, I don't have now the, um, I don't have now the, no, I, did, I didn't write it down here. Yeah. Um, so it turns out that black body absorption scales more dramatically. So this is why it's a dominating effect. So if you manage to kill, of course, black body absorption from the environment, then black body emission will start to take over. Okay, so, um, I, I, so I, I don't have the numbers at hand here now. If you look in either in our paper or also by this, um, into the paper by Oriol here, um, this, this FISREF A, there's a nice um, full derivation. And I think we, we, we somehow um, repeat that in our supplementary um, of, um, of our work uh, to, to give you the estimates. But it's, I can tell you the estimates that I showed you here. So um, uh, here, the, uh, this temperature estimates that they took already into account the black body emission. So it shows you that, uh, and here assuming that you have like a 500 Kelvin um, object. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Or, yeah. Oh, your, uh, Marcus, um, your double well potential. Um, so, uh, you mentioned about the separation of the superposition knots uh, large enough. Uh, can, is there a possibility to use your double well potential to create large uh, superposition so that you can for, uh, um, so that uh, that can solve a problem of uh, the separation being too small. Yeah, I, I wish I have an, I had, a, had a direct answer to that. Okay, mm. it's not clear to me yet if the um, uh, why? potentials would do the job. Um, mm. it's certainly, it's certainly a fascinating idea to think that in, in, in a similar way that we now do ground state cooling in a harmonic trap. What mm. happens if we ground state cool in a double well? Okay, mm. would that would that lead to something? Yeah, um, but what are the overheads to do that? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's certainly uh, you're right. I mean, this is this is a this is a direction one has to think of. Uh, think now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Info, okay. Yeah. Oh. Sugato, I cannot see the hands, but you, I you. I, I was myself going to ask exactly. Yeah, very very well. Almost Myungshik's question, but so. Uh, so actually, yeah. So so more broadly, I mean, what is the, you you would probably want to do something minimal now, right? After dropping, just to see the coherence or interfere something which is you know not too complicated yet will tell you you know about some interference effect, right? Yes. Yes. So uh, is there any good plan for that? So so for example, uh, the, so in the in the double well, of course, what worries me is that if it's dynamical, maybe the photon scattering decoherence is too much, right? When you yes, exactly, yeah, the, the photon recoil is really it's a lot, right? Yeah. So you see, even here it's like six kilohertz. This is a this is an extremely strong. Right. Uh, right. Uh, so so related to this, I had a question regarding say say <clears throat> this previous uh, you know the your ideas of generating superposition with x square measurements, right? Oriol's idea, which you were also mm -hmm. that. So 
um, what is the the <clears throat> like um, what is the minimum how, how much you can minimize the cavity decoherence really and 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 still say localize enough uh, is there a kind of estimate uh, if, if you make a good prediction like for the future not necessarily current cavities or things then. yeah okay to be honest um I, I really have not looked yet into the details here okay. so we are right now focusing on just um seeing if we can expand mm -hmm. uh, Concerning coherence, I mean, the, if you look at the, the early BC experiments, no, mm -hmm. um, one of the first things to test coherence is simply to retrap, right? free fall and retrap and measure temperature and to basically see that it, that it, hasn't, that it hasn't decohered. I mean, it's not direct right. evidence of coherent evolution, but it's um, certainly some indirect um, evidence. Right? I see. Mm, that's yeah. interesting. But for all the cavity dynamics, uh, this is all work in progress. Uh, so I, I, I don't have a good answer yet. So, but it's exactly the type of questions um, we need to we need to address now. Yeah. All right. I think um, we can uh, conclude here, and uh, we can thank uh, uh, Marcus for beautiful talk and beautiful work. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. <laughs> A pleasure as always, and I hope to see everyone in person soon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, yes. And a Happy New Year. And um, no, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy oh, New Year. Thanks a lot. Yes. Also, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Great. Great. Could, could Marcus be around for a bit longer? Yeah, sure. Recording or? Ma Marcus, I have to leave now. Uh, it's already yeah. like uh, uh, 1.30 in, uh, in the morning. Yeah. So here. Yes. No, of course. Of course. <laughs>